attention CDL drivers in Tuscarawas County. Kimball wants you to join their team, enjoy fantastic benefits, incentive pay, industry-leading wages, and be home with your family every night. Apply today at KimballCompanies.com slash careers. Kimball, recycling and disposal done right. Welcome to Talkin' Trash, where we try to answer all your questions about recycling and proper waste disposal in Tuscarawas County. I'm your host, Hannah Hartman, and joining me is my go-to expert on all things recycling here in Tuscarawas County, my sister, Rachel Rodocker. Hi, Rachel. Mm -hmm. Rachel is a passionate advocate for recycling and sustainable practices, and she has worked in our local recycling industry for several years. So her behind-the-scenes knowledge about how to recycle properly in Tuscarawas County is vast, and it is what will guide our ongoing discussions here on the Talkin' Trash podcast. This episode is being recorded on March 13th, 2024, and because rules and regulations change over time, some of what we discuss may have changed by the time you hear this, but with that caveat, let's dumpster dive into this discussion. So, Rachel, I always want to start with the basics of recycling here in Tuscarawas County, so can you please just quickly go through that list with our listeners? Yes, the thing I always talk about, it's kind of my go-to thing, is to like give someone a high five, and that'll <laughs> help guide your the five types of items that we generally accept in your curbside bins or at the public drop-offs. And that would be paper products, cardboard, we have metal cans, we have plastic bottles and jugs, and we have glass jars and bottles as well. So that's kind of the basics. And you want to stick within those. Don't veer too far outside of them. Otherwise, you might cause some issues. And obviously, there's a lot to, to kind of break down within each category. And that's basically what we're going to be doing on the Talking Trash podcast. And today, we want to focus on plastic. I think that's probably one of the categories that trips people up the most. Yes. Would you agree? Yes, okay. I would. We we don't see nearly as much contamination, especially with paper and cardboard, but uh, plastic, there's a lot of confusion around plastic. And, and so. when you say contamination, what exactly do you mean by that? Uh, that means anytime there's something unacceptable in your recycling bin. So it according, might... According to our yes. regulations here. Yes, our county, regional, yeah. Yeah. the people that uh, process the recycling. And that's, the goal of this podcast is to try to help those people who are trying to recycle properly um, to avoid contaminating those uh, loads of recyclables. Yes. So... Um, so we talk about plastic. Um, I know in, in our first inaugural episode, we were talking about glass and like, where does it go at the end of the recycling process? Um, is that something you can succinctly describe with plastic? Where does it go? To, I mean, it, I feel like maybe that can go in a lot of different directions. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, our, uh, the plastics that you put in your bin at the curb or you put in the dumpsters at the public drop-off sites, they're typically taken by recycling processors to what are called MRFs, which are materials recovery facilities. So the one, as an example, the Kimball Company, our local one here, uh, they have a lot of the contracts. They, uh, they take them up to their material recovery facility up in Twinsburg, Ohio. So the plastics end up there. From there, they get sorted and then bailed and then sent out to manufacturers to reuse for things. So a good example of plastics... Uh, the most common, most recycled ones are PET and HDP, which are numbers one and two. And we'll talk a little bit more to the numbers in a minute. But they usually will get uh, turned into clothing or other cloth, carpet, oh, wow. new containers in some cases mm -hmm. if they're sorted like that. Um, also, yeah, new detergent, detergent bottles, flower pots, crates, decking pipes, lot of lots of different things. Yeah. They can become, um, become new things. Okay. And that's the whole goal. Very good. <laughs> All right. So I want to move into a section that we're going to call common questions. Um, <clears throat> Rachel, are you sick of me sending you pictures and text messages asking, is this recyclable? <laughs> I've lost count of how many times I've done that. You've probably told me the same thing repeatedly. I just can't get it to stick. But it's almost always a plastic item yes. that I have questions <laughs> about. So I think we really need to get into that some more. Can we start by talking about the 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 numbers on the plastic and yes. like the chasing arrows around it you you said that's not really for me the consumer that's more for like the the producer maybe the end uh, yeah I, I was looking this up earlier because I wasn't sure when they even started putting those on containers so I found out that they were first introduced in 1988 by the U.S. Society of Plastics Industry okay. it, they've now shifted to another organization but the original intention was it was designed for 
basically workers at recycling facilities to be able to quickly identify the resin ID code of that plastic in order to sort, more efficiently sort. But yeah. the fact that it was chasing arrows, even though it was the end goal was to help with recycling, it wasn't to say this product is 100% recyclable. Right. It okay. was just to say, this is the resin code of this plastic, and it might happen to be able to be recycled. Okay. But it, those arrows are not really meant to tell us, the consumers, yes, this is recyclable, this is the number, and put it in, you know, this bin. So so basically, we should, like, as normal uh, consumers, um, just ignore that number when it comes to trying to decide, is this recyclable or not? For the most part, although I did read something I'd never heard um, earlier today, which is that the number, so there's one through seven, and they correspond to different groups, uh, different resins, mm -hmm. and uh, they actually were designed in that number to indicate the general ease and cost effectiveness of recycling. So the, high, the lower the number, the higher up on the list, it's actually the more desirable for recycling. So that's why you said typically ones and twos are acceptable as long as they're clean and dry and empty and everything. And then the lower you get on the list is when you start getting into dicier ones. So I would say that a good rule of thumb is if you have a question and you're holding something and you happen to see the number and it's a lower number and you're already having reservations, that it probably means don't even try to recycle it. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, that's helpful. Um, so going from there, do you personally have like a mental checklist that you go through in your head to determine if something is recyclable? Yes. Okay. <laughs> go through that list with me. Well, there's numerous things. I have a general rule of thumb. I mean, if we're talking specifically about plastics, but generally a rule of thumb I've heard is if it's something you can get at a typical grocery store, then it probably at least has the the capacity to be recycled, okay. whether it's recycled locally or not. That's when you have to start asking your your waste haulers, hey, can you take this, whatever. Okay. Yeah. Um, but generally, I uh, will look at the shape of the container and how clean is the container uh, with plastics. Does it have a, a neck and shoulders? Is it a bottle and jug shaped or is it a different shape? It kind of helps. It's almost like one of those diagrams where you're like, answer yes or no, and then it leads you to a different response is kind of how I do it. Sorry. <laughs> so, yeah, so we talk a lot about the neck and shoulder. So you think of like a just a typical like plastic bottle of, let's say, shampoo or something. Yes. It's got that neck and the shoulders. So it's likely recyclable. Yes. Um, we had also, uh, before we started on this podcast, you, we talked about, um, did it contain a hazardous substance? Yes. Talk about that. That one is a little trickier, um, and I had to confirm it earlier because we actually also, there's a hazardous waste collection center. Right. So if you do happen to have something that is motor oil and half of it's left, and for whatever reason it ex expired, you know, hazardous stuff still expires, um, you don't want it, then you would want to take it to a designated hazardous waste disposal place. But let's say that you do happen to have an empty bottle yeah. that had bleach or cleaner or something mm -hmm. one i say was it at a grocery store yes yeah. cleaners would be two so is be it okay. empty yeah okay it's empty that's okay the only other thing is if it happens to be a substance like motor oil that you really can't get it out with a quick rinse mm -hmm. then the only way you would want to try to recycle it is if you as a consumer took the time to put detergent in the oh, bottle <laughs> rinse it and get all the oil out yeah. otherwise it will make it so that it's well going to contaminate the water, and let me so. kind of go to a maybe a um i don't know if it's more common but maybe a more common example peanut butter jars yes so, that's a good example. yeah so like <laughs> it's not you're not gonna rinse out that leftover scrapes of peanut butter with a quick rinse no but if you do take the time to like really spray it, really get that out of there, you can recycle that, right? Yes. yes. Um, they they can take a certain amount of that residual waste, mm -hmm. but the more that's in the loads, the lower quality, the lower grade material it is, and the fewer people want lower grade material. Yeah. So the cleaner, the better. And yeah. peanut butter is a good one where I have people say, you know how I get mine clean? I let my dog look at <laughs> it. I say, hey, that's that's okay. You're that's saying that works. Right? Okay. okay. As long as they can get the peanut yeah, butter. Yeah, I'll help you out here with your recycling. <laughs> I like it. But ultimately, you do want an end product as as the recycling, like the, you know, the, the, the entity picking up the recycling, you want your, the product to be clean, dry and empty pretty much. Yes. Right. Yes. Um, I know we were talking about, I don't know how, how important dry really is in this equation, uh, as yeah. long as it's clean and empty, but you, you had said the reason they say that is because if you're throwing, let's say, um, 
you, let's say you rinsed out a um, peanut butter jar yeah. and you think, well, it will dry in the recycle bin. Well, if you put that in the recycle bin with some paper that you're trying to recycle, it might actually, Hurt while it's still chances. wet, yeah, yeah, it could affect the quality of the paper you're yes. trying to recycle. <laughs> That's kind of why you throw the dry into that. Yes. Clean, dry, and empty is what we're saying. But, okay. but clean is it's the a good rule of thumb. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. I always talk about the rules of thumb. Okay. <laughs> so I do want to get into a couple of specific examples because these are the ones I'm pretty sure I've texted you about multiple <laughs> times sure. and I just can't ever keep it straight in my head. Talk about bottle caps. Okay, that's that's a good one. Um, again, rule of thumb. <laughs> we generally say that if you if it came with a cap on it, the best thing to do is after it's empty, of course, is to put the cap back on it. And the reason for that is because once that bottle ends up at the material recovery facility, wherever all the recycling ends up, if the caps were loose, they probably wouldn't make it through the process. But if the caps are on the bottles, they will stay attached to the bottles, you know, in most cases, and actually get recycled in the end. Now, Be because oh. they're so small, yes. right? Like, yes, in, it's in, a size. In this material re uh, recovery facility, there's all these different ways that they fil like filter out things. Yes. And being that small, it could get filtered out, even though it is recyclable. That is true. Okay. And there is an exception. We have people that do participate in bottle cap specific recycling right. programs. Yeah. And so we're not si discouraging them from turning the, you know, all your bottle oh, caps sure, into yeah. a bench or a table. Yeah. That, that's a good thing. And in that case, you still can recycle the capless bottle, no issue. But we're saying that if you have the cap and you're not going to participate in that program, that it's better to put it back on the bottle. Okay, cool. And let's also talk about prescription pill bottles. Is yes. it a similar thing? or is it, it? Yeah, it is a similar Similar thing. I mean, just like anything, they come with a little more nuance to them because you Different definitely sizes. don't. Well, you don't want them to have pills on them, so that's a, a nuance. Empty. And a lot of people have reservation about their information being on a bottle. Sure. So unless you want to peel the label which off or do. black it out, yeah. which you could do. But the other thing is the size, because a lot of the typical pill bottles, one, some of them don't have the neck and shoulders, which is kind of the rule of thumb. But two, some of them are smaller. They always were telling us if it's smaller than the length of a credit card then it likely will fall through the grates at the material recovery facility. Okay. So some of them are smaller. Now, if I'm thinking of like a vitamin bottle, something I get big supplements, okay, that yeah. probably would make it through. Okay. So generally, I myself will put those on. And, I, and I think <laughs> it's probably worth saying like you could put the prescription yes. bottle in. Yeah. It just probably won't get recycled exactly. in the end. So. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And then um, let's for briefly talk about common things that aren't accepted. Like you sure. see a lot of, um, you know, whether or not people, I, I, I tend to think that people don't really have bad intentions. And, and we're going to get to the term wish cycling here in a little bit. But yes. <laughs> I think most people have good intentions and they think this is plastic, therefore it's recyclable. So you see a lot of similar types of items trying to be recycled, but they just, they, they aren't. So yes. um, we Talk about um, like rigid plastics. Yes, the rigid plastics are a big one with plastics because um, they're too big. Uh, they can jam up the equipment at a sorting facility. So think lawn furniture or a kiddie pool, something like that. Clearly, it's not, even though sometimes you can find those at certain grocery stores. Think Aldi, the Isle of Shame is always what I think about. But, you know, regardless, those are too big. Those are not a typical bottle and jug size plastic. Okay. So those could jam up the equipment. Um Kind of similarly, we talk about children's toys. Uh, people, oh, I have all these kids' meal toys, and I know because I'm we're guilty of that in my household. <laughs> sure. You don't want to try to recycle those. Those are usually not just plastic or usually oh. not just a single type of plastic. Okay. They often have multiple um, multiple kinds of Good materials products. and there are okay. multiple commodities in there, so those aren't a good one. Okay. Um uh, buckets. Yeah, buckets, laundry hampers. I mean, again, we, flower pots. We, we see a lot of that stuff in the bins, and it, it's usually well-intentioned people. They want to see it recycled. The thing broke. But in the public drop-off bins or in your curbside bin, that is not how to recycle them. Locally, we don't really have the opportunity, but some areas will hold special drives just for rigid plastics well, because they are a recyclable product. That's what I was just about to so. ask because, like, the reason you're saying don't put it here in Tuscarawas County, don't put it in your recycle bin, it's not really that it's not recyclable. It's Correct. just that it's going to jam up the machine yes. that is going to sort the recycling. Keep in mind that these systems, like at the material recovery facility, they are handling so much material, a high volume of material a day, and they're designed to take bottles and jugs. That's The equipment is designed for that. Gotcha. So 
So if we, you know, if any of the uh, local waste hauling people that actually take the recycling, if they decide to get a special piece of equipment that would filter out certain other plastics or certain, then that, you know, it could change. That's why it it all does change. And there's a little nuance to it. But (laughs) but that's why we're talking about it. And that's... uh, To go back, you know, that's why I say right at the introduction of this Mm -hmm. podcast when we're recording this, because it it could change. I don't know that there's any plans to do that here in the near future, but be aware of your local regulations Mm -hmm. um, in in the current day. (laughs) All right. So let's get into our dumpster diving segment. So I always like to uh, check uh, the dumpster at the radio station to see. Uh, And when I say dumpster, I mean a a recycling dumpster. So I want to see what people are putting in there. And I'm not going to call anybody out by name, but I want to I'm trying to help everybody learn here together what what they should and what they should not be putting in that recycling dumpster. Yes. Why don't we start with, I bet this is something you see pretty common Mm -hmm. um, if you're listening, not watching this podcast. It's a fast food plastic cup with a plastic lid. Yes. That is not something they really want in there right now. So for one, let's use our... One rule of thumb. Well, it's not in a grocery store, so that's kind of one of my rules. Okay. No neck and shoulder, so that's another one. Mm -hmm. If I were to look at the plastic, it says it's a type 5, so that's a little lower on the list, so keep that in mind, too, if you do look at that. Um, Also, this is a kind of brittle plastic. It's usually one that as soon as it starts to get compacted in the truck or up to the materials recovery facility, it's not going to stay in a single piece. This Uh, one's pretty big. It might, but like this probably the lid itself wouldn't. A straw wouldn't. Yeah. The cups often are brittle. So I would say that that is not something that should go in a recycling. So bin. here in Tuscarawas <laughs> County, just throw your fast food cup in the trash. Yes. You're done. Try to avoid getting it in the first place is the best thing. Well, well we talked a little bit about that in episode one. So, yeah, yeah the, the more you can um, refuse things yes. that you know are going to end up in the trash, the better. So. Yep. <laughs> All right. Next. Now, this was a weird one. I don't even really know what this is. So, for, so if you're listening, not watching, how would you... Uh, this is maybe it's like a, like a metal... Paper. Let's say, let's call it a metal paperweight. I don't okay. know if that's actually what it is, but you can... You can see it's yeah, metal. It's, it's metal. Yeah. So I can see why somebody might think... And it's be smaller, so I, yeah, I could see that. However, this... Uh, we don't want what we call scrap metal in a typical bin. Okay. They want metal cans. Again, think a grocery store, cat food cans, soup cans, things like that. Mm-hmm. Or think aluminum pop cans or beer cans or whatever you want. Okay. This is so heavy, it could be damaging to drop into a truck for okay. one thing. I mean, yeah. this specifically is smaller, yeah. but any scrap metal, again, could get jammed up in equipment. Uh, the good news is that so- there are local scrap yards that will take metal that is scrap metal, mm-hmm. bigger chunks of metal or denser and the good way to be able to tell usually they want to know if it's called ferrous or non-ferrous metal so if you have a magnet you could find out what kind of metal this is so So good news it could be be recycled recycled. but (laughs) bad news you would basically have to take another step yes. as the consumer to make sure it ends up getting recycled because you can throw it in your curbside recycle bin okay (laughs) we also have well this is a big one rachel Mm-hmm. A plastic carryout container. I would kind of liken this to a clamshell, as mm-hmm. it probably did have it a did lid. It did at one point see. have a lid, yeah. Um, and kind of similar to our cup. It's, you know, it's not grocery store specific, although there are clamshells sure. that are like strawberries that are from oh, grocery yeah. store. So that's kind of another brittle plastic. Um, and no neck and shoulders. My guess is it's a number five. Yep. <laughs> so <Very good> kind of <laughs> hits all the same Kind of hits all the same boxes where I would say not to put that in. Plus, another reason they don't, even though, again, number five plastics generally, they're uh, polystyrene, or no, not polystyrene, polypropylene. They are recy- a recyclable type of plastic, but the reason that uh, the public drop-offs locally don't want them is because they happen to usually come with food in them that gets stuck on them and people don't clean them well, and they're just not as desirable of a plastic for okay. the processor. So. And again, I want to reiterate that it can be very frustrating when you're trying <laughs> to do the right thing only to be told, up, throw it in the trash, up, throw it in the trash. But I'll go back to, that's why we're doing this podcast. We want to help those people who are trying to do it the right way. Last thing, um, and this kind of goes to the, I think, the rigid plastics. Um, I found basically a broken flower pot. Yes. Um, Not recyclable. recyclable. Um, For all the reasons we discussed. I will say if you happen to have, um, like, the little planter ones and they're in good condition, that some of the local, like, I I was reading about this, I need to confirm it locally, but Lowe's or other plant centers sometimes will take flower pots back Mm -hmm. or you yourself can save them for reuse. So. 
They're not necessarily. This now one this one's be broken. Very helpful, yeah. I would probably yeah. just toss it. Just fortune, just but. trash. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> all right. So that's that's all for dumpster diving. <laughs> um, I had mentioned earlier that we were going to talk about the term wish cycling. Yes. Yeah. The, that basically means tossing questionable items in the bin with the hopes that they're going to get recycled. And I can't fault consumers for having this mentality because. Pretty much whenever they introduce single stream recycling, which was one bin at your curb and you throw everything in there and then they take it and they sort it all out, they pretty much said, oh, our equipment is so sophisticated. You throw everything in there and we'll take care of the rest. That's back when uh, the standards for where the stuff was going were lower. Now the standards are higher, so they really want clean stuff. They want the right stuff. They need high quality stuff. So. I don't fault people for having that mentality because it's basically what we were trained to do whenever they first were introducing all these curbside recycling programs. But the reality is nowadays they don't want more. They want better when it comes to it's the quality versus quantity. Yeah, yeah they don't just want more. They want the best stuff. Yeah. So wish cycling can be dangerous. It can lead to uh, an entire load of otherwise recyclable materials getting trashed because wow. generally what they'll do is they'll look at a load visually. They'll inspect it. And if they see that it's more then for uh, more than, I don't know, 25% contaminated, they'll just immediately trash it. But wow. some of them have even higher standards than that. So, so. yeah, what you, you may be thinking like, oh, I'm, I'm doing the right thing. I think this is recyclable. I'm, I, I hope it is. I'm going to throw it in there. That could ultimately have the exact opposite yes. effect of having <laughs> an otherwise good load of recyclables getting Yep, it's the the when in doubt, throw it out. Is there? We've been. I love running. So yeah, I've really tried to. For a while, I had like a a, a graphic, like sticky tacked above my recycle bin at home. It was like, if it's not this, 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 or this, just throw it in the trash. And that does hurt when you're somebody who. (laughs) I would prefer to not have anything go in the trash if I could reuse it or recycle it or whatever. That would be my goal. But there are just things that as an average consumer of typical products, a lot of it's going to end up in the trash. And that hurts, but ultimately I want as much to be recycled, to be recycled, therefore better quality, not quantity. More quantity. Correct. All right. (laughs) So before we wrap up, I want to talk about, um, I want to every episode talk about a simple substitute, right? Like um, today, this is such a a no-brainer, I think, reusable grocery bags. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that is one. The reason that that one I think is important is one, because you have control over it. You don't have control about what's wrapped around the The food you get, but the actual grocery bags, you have some level of control. And in some places, they do incentivize you to use them. But also because uh, plastic bags are not acceptable in your curbside bin or in the public drop-offs, there are special places that will collect them. But even then, there's very limited uses for them. So there's some questioning whether they really all get recycled or not. Um, So it's best. That's a great example of where you can just reduce. (laughs) You can refuse using them and reduce your your usage by using your own. Um, uh, Even putting items into the bin, they don't want you to bag them. They don't want plastic in there. It can get tangled in the equipment and they have to shut down the whole operation to dig this out. So because, you know, you think, well, I've got a trash bag in my trash can, yep. and I put a trash bag in my recycle bin. But think about that. You're putting a trash bag in your recycle bin, bin but it's trash. So, yeah, you don't want to wrap all of your recyclable goods in trash. In trash. Yep. <laughs> so it, it seems counterintuitive because we just we need something. You need uh, to carry it in something. I just say just dump it out, in, and then I reuse my recycle bag in my trash can. So there I'll take it out, dump it, put that in the and then it's good to go. There you <laughs> go. Okay, so reusable grocery bag. Yes. All right. And then finally, let's wrap up with um, a little bit of good news. And um, oh, man, I, I, I meant to bring a, a an info sheet with me, but I'll just uh, kind of ad lib. <laughs> um, a few weeks ago, the Tuscarawas County Public Library in New Philadelphia held a sustainable living fair. And th- to me, the good news of this is it was bopping. Like it was, it was there. They believe this was the first time they had done this event. Uh, and there was a lot of interest. I heard people saying I had to park three blocks away just to find parking. You know, like there were uh, people from other counties coming to this. Mm-hmm. You know, they were talking about things like um, solar panels, um, uh Foraging in the forest, they had uh, home butchering classes, um, uh, 
all, all kinds of sustainable life yes. type activities. And uh, the frustrating thing was you couldn't attend everything because there was overlap yeah. of some classes. So I kind of had to pick and choose, but it was fascinating. And, and to me, it's, I'm, sometimes I feel like you and I are the only ones who care at all <laughs> about recycling or sustainability. I know that's not true. And I've definitely spoken with people in this community who definitely do care about that stuff, but you often feel like a minority in this community. Yeah. And that was a, a great um, visual, like just seeing all of those people with an interest in that kind of stuff was like, okay, there are more of us out there who are interested yeah. in this <laughs> kind of stuff. So big props to the Tuscarawas County Public Library for mm -hmm. holding that event. I would be shocked if they didn't do it again next year, given how popular it was. And so, yeah, I, it was uh, near the end of February. So be looking around the beginning of next year for more information about uh, the Sustainable Living Fair. It was just, you know, vendors with um, products, of course, educators talking about these different topics. And, and yeah, just super interesting. So I like I like a little and bit. And I do it. think the reason it's good news is, like you said, that there are other like-minded people that want to make a difference. Yeah. Um, I think it's easy to get overwhelmed as someone trying to make a difference because you know that so much of you, there's so much out of your control that it can be very discouraging. But I always just try to frame it like, well, I can only do what I can do. So I'm going to try to do it right. That way the stuff ends up where it needs to be. Or So... Thanks. All right. Anything else you want to throw in there for today's episode? No. All right. That's going to do it for the Talking Trash podcast. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. Thank you.